You know, guys, we work really hard. Brett does a great job of picking out songs for us to sing on Sunday that are rich and full of good theology. You know, many times it's good theology put into a poetic or kind of artistic form, and that's totally cool. I mean, we see the Psalms do that and other parts of Scripture. It's okay to be creative and sing words that aren't exactly Scripture but theologically aligned with good Scripture. So that, that's a good thing. And then sometimes we sing songs that are almost historical narrative as we remember what God has done and how he has provided. We see Israel doing that. We see God's people doing that historically in the New Testament. And, and we do the same. And then sometimes we sing songs that are almost creedal. They, they're singing statements about the truths theologically of God. Our, my friend Tony Morita says this, music is portable theology, meaning that, that we can think and sing songs that are good theology and they carry, uh, we carry them with us as we go maybe throughout our day. The song we just sang is kind of a creedal statement of faith. We sing a theological summary about what we believe the scriptures teach, things that hopefully we as followers of Jesus can agree on, uh, beliefs that unite us in our worship of God. And this morning, if you're not there, that's okay. If, if you're not a follower of Jesus or you're not sure where you are in your journey of Jesus, we love that you are here. We love that maybe you're just trying to check things out. We're all in process, and so we're totally cool with that, okay? But Christianity holds a certain set of beliefs that unite followers of Jesus that we need to agree on to be true followers of Christ. And we find these beliefs in Scripture first. The, the Scripture are authoritative, so, so that's where we begin. But then other godly people that have gone before us Sometimes they've codified those things into something that we might call a creed. There's, there's something called the Apostles' Creed. That's kind of what was in the song we just sang. And, and creeds are, are okay. They're actually good. And then much later, we see in the church that there are catechisms or, or Christian uh, statements of faith. Organizations or, or, or denominations have come up with these confessions about what is at the core of our faith. We as a church... We have a confession. We have a statement of belief. If you're new to the field, you probably looked at our website. You perhaps read what we believe, and you're like, oh, I, I kind of like that, or I don't understand that. But, but there's certain things that we hold to as a confession, as a church, and there's summary statements about the biblical essentials that we need to hold in order to be true followers of Jesus. And within Christendom, we find that there are variations but there's still a core, uh, majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors, core things that we hold essential. Theological unity, at the most basic level, is essential for Christianity. Jesus even prayed for that. Jesus prayed that, that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. The psalm that we are going to be looking at this morning in our series of songs for the summer, Psalm 133, reminds us of what a blessing it is to be united as we come to worship God. It says it is good and pleasant to have unity around God and who he is as the people of God. So I'm going to read that psalm to you, but you can turn there, and probably by the time you've turned there, I will have already read it, because it's really short. This week and next week, short songs, psalms, but long sermons, okay? So hold on there, right? We, we've got content for you this morning. Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down on the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Now, if you think about it, these psalms of ascent, once again, are, are psalms that, that the Jewish people would sing together. They would recite, they would rehearse as they headed up to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, to worship God in the temple. We worship in unity. It's important 
And, and that's the context for this. As they go up, they are worshiping the God of heaven who created everything. He is different than the pagan gods of the, of the people that surrounded Israel. Yahweh is what made Israel distinct and separate from the people around them. They had their gods, but Israel worshiped the one true God. And so this unity around him is so important. Uh, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers, I would say, and sisters to dwell together in unity. Unity is a blessing from God, and it's something that only he can give, and it's what he desires for his people as we come together to worship him. But unity is so hard to come by, and it can be so fragile when we have it. And we've seen how fractured our culture is, and yes, unfortunately, even in the church of Jesus Christ, we see these fractures and sometimes disunity. We live in an era of great polarization and disunity, and we have difficulty getting along with each other in the culture, and unfortunately, we have difficulty getting along with each other in the church sometimes. Well, we're going to look at that this morning. Satan, our enemy, loves chaos. He loves disunity. He loves destruction and disorder. His desire is to disrupt in contrast to that, our God is a God of order. We read in creation that, that ex nihilo, God speaks things into existence. And in the midst of that creation, he takes disorder and brings it to order. And then he puts man in the garden, and part of man's job is to be fruitful and multiply, but to subjugate, to rule over, and to expand order in the creation. So that's what God is about, and yet, what we find there is that in our rebellion against God, in the beginning, we destroy order. We bring chaos. We bring division and disunity between God and us and between man and man. And we've been struggling with disunity ever since then. So with that as the context, seeing that God is a God of order, but Satan wants to destroy and disrupt Listen to those words again. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. In the human sinful condition, unity is not something that comes naturally. But as verse 1 says, when brothers and sisters exist together in unity and peace, and here when you think about brothers and sisters dwelling together in unity and peace, think of the people of God. At that point, Israel, now the church. But how wonderful it is for us to have this unity. It's good and pleasant. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And that's the picture we have here. It's so important that God has given us a complete whole psalm that talks about this unity. And in verse two and three, we have illustrations that, 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 that are, are meant to get our hearts around the importance of this unity. Verse two, it is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. Now here's the deal. When I read that illustration, I'm like, what? Okay, maybe you're with me, okay? Okay. Oil coming down off my head, onto my beard, onto my clothes. I'm like, ooh, that's icky. That's gross, okay? I'm a shower guy, okay? I'm like at least one and not two showers a day, especially on a hot day like this. I want to get the oil off of me. You know, I want to get clean. So we miss the illustration maybe because of our, of our culture. But culturally, the anointing of Aaron's head, which, which this Aaron was Moses' brother, the first ordained priest over Israel, the oil flowing over him, that was a representation of God's approval, his blessing, his, his approval of, of Aaron as the priest. When David was called to be king, the prophet Samuel came to his house, and what did he do? He anointed David with oil. It's just, again, this, this approval of God. When Jesus is headed to the cross, what do we see? We see the prostitute come and anoint him with perfume and oil and bless him. He is the king, even though he's going to be the suffering king. That's the picture that, that, that we, we have lost. It's kind of a cultural thing. 
And here with this statement, in verse two, you have to think of God's total approval. It's rich and flowing and abundant. That's what this illustration is pointing to. The blessing of God that brings together unity as the people of God come together to worship him in his holy mountain. But if that illustration is lost on you, which it was lost on me until I understand the culture behind it, then we have verse three, which those of us that live in Southern California, we get this one. It is like dew on Mount Hermon, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Most of Israel was arid like Southern California. It was hot there, rocky and hot. Water was precious. I mean, think about Southern California. Without all those irrigation projects, we wouldn't have the population we have here because we need water to live and there's not a lot around here. Think about the last couple of years. We've had some abundant uh, rain and how green things got early and they stayed green for a while. That's the picture here. Mount Hermon was in the north, about 100 miles from Jerusalem. And it was about 9,000 feet. And it would get snow capped in the winter and then during the, the spring, lots of rain. So a lot of vegetation and forest and, and think of flourishing with all that green. Again, what happens here when it does rain, um, if you can get beyond the floods, but the, the green and, and, and the life that comes from water. And, and those are the conditions now, thinking about Jerusalem and Mount Zion, where it is kind of desert-y and more arid. And the picture is, if, 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 if the the water that was blessing Mount Hermon was on, on uh, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's the kind of blessing it is for, for brothers and sisters who dwell together in unity to, to get along with each other. You know, it makes me think of, of, of a memory that I shared with, with some of you guys that were around in, in 2020 in the early days of the pandemic. For some reason, I started thinking about the 1992 riots. I guess because during that pandemic, things were kind of kind of wonky. There, were, there was there was a, 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 a lot of atrocities going on with some some racial issues in our in our country, and it was it was painful for 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 most of us. And and, and I thought about LA in 1992, where I was living at the time. And I remember it like it was yesterday, but in another way, it seems like it was almost like a dream, like like a a foreign world that, that I experienced, another life. The riots had been going on for several days. The tensions were out of control. Stores and businesses were being vandalized and, 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 and lit on fire. And, and Wilma and I were not married yet, my wife and I, and we were still working professionally. I was working in aerospace as an engineer. She's working for the Department of Water and Power in LA. And we were taking night classes at Talbot Seminary, part of Biola University. And so we had gone out to class, we, we still went to class, we were still going to work, and our teachers had let us out early due to the riots, and I was following her home, and it was at dusk, and we were on the 91 freeway, and nine, normally the 91 freeway was just packed, it always was packed, always crowded, but that night it was eerily empty, it was just like us in the fast lane, and then over in the slow lane, there were lines of Humvees, National Guard Guardsmen that had been called out because of the riots. And as we drove along the 91, I looked over to the north, I looked to the south, and I saw columns of smoke going up, and I thought, this is, this is weird. This is home. This is L.A., where I was from. And yet, it was like a war zone. And it was a war zone. It was a crazy time of history living in L.A., now, those of you that know the history, remember that the riots were sparked by the verdict of a grand jury uh, trial, which failed to convict some LAPD officers who were captured on video the year before mistreating a, 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 a drunken or, or drugged up um, man who had been speeding and failed to pull over, and then they beat this man mercilessly. And that man was Rodney King. And the whole thing was an incredible mess. Rodney had been on parole for burglary. And then he had been, I guess, drinking. And, and, and so he fled when they were asking him to pull over. And then the police officers overstepped their boundaries by far when they arrested him and, and beat him. And, and later, as a result of the trial that came out, L.A. ignited for about a week. And there's something from that era that has always stuck in my head 
that happened on the third day of the, the riots. Rodney King, uh, I think voluntarily, uh, made a public appearance and a public plea, and with a quivering voice, he said to the cameras and the media, in the midst of the chaos, he said, people, I, I just want to say, can't we all get along? And then he repeated it, can't we all get along? And even though he had been mistreated, his plea was to stop the violence and stop the chaos and stop the conflict. And those words have resonated in my ears and my heart over the years ever since then. Whenever I see a conflict, and not just racial, certainly that, but when I see a conflict between husband and wife, between child and parent, between church members, members of the body of Christ, I think to myself, can't we all just get along? What a great call for unity. Can't we get along? And the answer to that is, yes, we can. And no, we can't. God wants us all to get along, to treat each other with love and compassion and grace and patience and equality and forgiveness. But we know that left to our own devices and our own strength without the gospel, no, we cannot get along. Human history is replete with examples of that. We are critical of each other. We bite and devour. We grumble and complain. And that's just in the church. It's so incredibly sad that all too often conflict is what seems to characterize us as followers of Jesus more than the fruit of the Spirit. No, we cannot get along. We can't all get along if left to ourselves. Almost from the beginning, we couldn't. If you think about it, go back to the beginning. Four people on the planet, and Cain kills Abel. And that conflict has continued throughout human history. And the church of Jesus Christ is not immune to this kind of conflict. You just look at the New Testament. The conflict between believing Jewish people and believing non-Jewish people, Gentiles. The conflict in many of the letters that Paul writes to the churches that's going on in, in Corinth, for example. The conflict between Peter and Paul over a theological issue. Or Paul and Barnabas over John Mark, just to mention a few. The human heart is desperately wicked, and that's why we need a savior. We need someone to save us from sin and death, to save us from ourselves, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We need Jesus' righteousness because we don't have our own and that's the gospel. And it's only the gospel that can bring about rest, reconciliation and, and restoration between God and man and between man and man. The gospel is our only hope for the world and for ourselves. And that's the unity that we read about in Psalm 133. It's a unity that comes from God that can do the impossible so we can get along. Because we have experienced forgiveness, we can now show that forgiveness with others, the same that we have received. As Christ's followers, that is what we have, a gospel of peace and reconciliation and unity. And as we learn to live in and apply the gospel to our lives, yes, we have what we need to get along so the answer to that question is yes, we can if we really embrace the gospel and learn to live by it and apply it in our relationships with each other. That's an incredible blessing for brothers and sisters to dwell in unity because that is not the norm outside of what God can do for us. And even as his people, we need to remember that. Paul reminds the believers in Philippi of this. The Philippian church, as you know, we've done some work in that, and I've talked about maybe doing PhD studies in it. Um, it was a healthy church. It was a good church. They had partnered with Paul in the gospel. Most of Paul's letters were written to correct theological error and conflict within the church. But when he writes to the Philippian believers, he goes, I had incredible joy because of our partnership. You guys are actually doing really good. But they weren't perfect. Like, no church is perfect. 
And in this church, there were two women, Yodia and Syntyche, and they had a conflict brewing between them such that Paul actually addressed them specifically in this letter. He calls them out. I, I want to take you to that as an example, and we're going to flesh this idea of living out in unity versus conflict by looking at them as an example. In Philippians 4.2, we read this. Paul writes, I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Basically, he's writing and saying, guys, we're on the same team, Team Jesus, the, the, the gospel team. You've done well in the past. Let's get along now with each other. And, and, and man, do we need to hear those words today in the church? We don't know much about these two women or the conflict that they were having, except perhaps here earlier in the letter, Paul reaches out and says to all of the believers in Philippi how to treat each other in Christ, but we do know that they were part of the church in Philippi. We know that they were followers of Jesus. We know that these women were partners in the gospel with Paul, and they shared in the struggle for the gospel together. They were fellow workers, and their names are written in the book of life, which is a reference to their eternal salvation. They were sisters in Christ, but we don't know much more about their conflict other than it was big enough for Paul to address it publicly in this letter to the church. Now, it's probably good that we don't know much about them or, or, or the conflict because that leaves it open for us to apply what Paul is saying to them to our own lives. We can't go, well, that was their problem, not ours. No, we, we have had conflict as, as, as the body of Christ. It might be something as silly as with Yodi and Syntyche, they disagreed over the color of the bathroom to be painted at the church. I mean, it sounds silly. A friend of mine who's a mega church pastor in North County had that in his church. Two women, they couldn't agree on the aesthetics. It's like, whoa, really? Or it could have been something more significant, okay? Um, something about how do these Jewish believers mix with the non-Jewish believers. We don't know what the fight was about. It was probably not a significant doctrinal error because Paul never shied away from correcting gently, but correcting doctrinal error. Whatever it was, it was big enough though for Paul to address it and apparently the whole church to know about whatever it was. And Paul was not trying to shame them publicly, but he was writing saying, look you guys, you need to get along for the sake of the gospel. Now think about this, and I've thought about this, okay? Can you imagine being one of these two ladies, okay? For all of history and all of eternity, your name is called out. It's like, oh, crud, man, I'm called out, you know, again, not public shame, but it's like, wow, can't we get along? They couldn't resolve it though, so Paul has to step in and say something, and that's an incredible bummer. Paul had already written in this letter about the essence of getting along when he writes in Philippians chapter 2, 1, this, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. How? By being of the same mind. That means united. Maintaining the same love, united. United in spirit, intent on one purpose. What is that one purpose? The gospel. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility, and that's such an important word for getting along, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, if you look at that picture, and this is for us today, because of what Jesus has done, 
Be of the same mind. Be of the same love. Be united in the spirit. Be intent on one purpose, which is that partnership in the gospel. And this doesn't mean that you can't have your own opinions. Surely we are going to have differences. We are not called to be clones. Unity doesn't necessarily mean conformity in all areas. But Paul calls it out and says, but don't be selfish or conceited. Instead, walk in humility toward one another. Regard others as more important than yourselves. Look for the needs of others and meet those needs. Basically, look at how Jesus gave himself on our behalf. And as followers of Jesus, let's follow that example. Let's be for each other, not against each other. These women had worked hard for the gospel. They had struggled along with Paul. They were on the same team with the rest of Paul's fellow workers, and yet their conflict was tearing them apart and hurting the church and hurting the gospel witness of the church. That's so important to recognize. Paul warns Timothy about the conduct we should have as partners in the gospel, when, when he writes this in 2 Timothy, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. See, these traits, as as ministers of the gospel, we're called to not be quarrelsome. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't stand for the truth, but but so many people love to argue, and it's, no, don't be quarrelsome. Be kind to all. Be patient when wrong. Be gentle when you do need to correct. And yes, we do need to correct. We're not wishy-washy, but we... Correct with gentleness in mind, with the goal of helping people come to their senses, escaping the devil so that they are not captive to him and doing his will. It's a rescue operation that we are called to for each other and for those in the culture. You know, a, a great way to approach someone, to correct them gently, is to ask good questions that are not accusative. Come in humility and and understand that maybe you have it wrong so you seek to understand. Understand the person's heart. Understand their motive by asking good questions. Have the courage to go there but be slow in judging them. Think about the Christian leaders you know. Do you see this in their lives? Think about yourself. Do you see this humility in your life? Do you see this patience in your life? You know, God tells us in James why some of this disunity exists, why these quarrels exist. Listen to what we read about in James 4.1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts and disunity among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know, it comes down to the heart, the heart check. Think about it. If you're in a marital conflict right now, what is fueling that? So much of it is, I'm right, they're wrong. I want my way. I've been hurt, I have rights. Look at what this passage tells us. What's going on in our hearts? And that's exactly what the gospel does. It goes into our hearts and causes us to examine our own hearts. Not somebody else's heart. What's going on in my heart? Check how the gospel works in this. If if we turn to Ephesians chapter 2, we have a, a, a great example of how the gospel works through these conflicts and these issues. You know, one of the major conflicts in the early church was between the Jewish followers of Jesus and the non-Jewish followers of Jesus, the Gentiles. In fact, if you don't understand that conflict, you won't understand a lot of the New Testament, okay? It was a cultural and race issue. There was a division 
ethnically that was driving these relational issues. You see, the Jews were first the people of God. Jesus says he came first to the household of Israel. He came to his own Jewish people first. Now, he didn't end there, but he came there. And then he comes to the non-Jewish people. And God grafts in these Gentiles into the family of God. And that's so cool. Except now you have these pagan people who have never followed the law, who formerly didn't mix with the Jews and the Jews with them, now part of the family of God. And many of the Jewish people are excited about that. They're like, wow, God not only saves the Jews, he saves the non-Jewish people. And that's good for me because I'm not Jewish. Some of you are, but I'm not. But God grafted me in. Praise God, I didn't deserve it. But here's the deal. Many of the Jewish believers also felt displaced for a while. They're like, hey, we were first. We were first in, so you need to abide by our rules. And the Gentile believers are going, so do we have to be circumcised? And the Bible says no, but some of the Jewish believers are saying yes. Do we need to follow your law? No, but the Bible, the Bible, Bible says no, but some were saying yes. And so again, to understand the, the New Testament, God is calling these people into one family where there should be no prejudice. We are all under the body and the blood of Christ. And yet, there was this racial conflict and tension going on in the early church. So Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, you Gentiles, have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. He levels the playing field. All of us, both Jew and Gentile, we were dead in our sin and the blood of Christ draws us into the family of God. Verse 14, for Jesus is our peace. He's our peace between God and man and between man and man and man and woman and woman and woman. That's why we stand in Jesus who made both groups into one, unity, broke down the barrier and the dividing wall. Both groups, Jews and Gentiles, are now in one family. And he does this by abolishing in his flesh the conflict, the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, one family thus establishing peace. So there should be no prejudice in the body of Christ. Verse 16, and he reconciles them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death this conflict, this enmity. And he came and preached peace, unity, to you who were far away. And peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And that's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus, by shedding his blood, brings us peace, brings unity amongst his people, and we have access as one people to God. And because of this peace, we now as his followers are to work for unity, work for peace as far as it is possible for us to be at peace with all people. Listen to what Paul tells the believers in Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. That, that's unity. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, what do you do? No, you feed him. And if he's thirsty, you give him a drink, for in so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. Be at peace with all people if possible. That's what we are to aim toward. 
Now, there are times when it's just not possible. We have an example in Scripture, okay? It was not a theological conflict. It was not a moral conflict. But we have this example with Paul and Barnabas over Barnabas' cousin, John Mark. John Mark had traveled with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and yet somewhere along that trip, he pulled the eject button, and he bailed. He left. It, it got hard. It got difficult. He was homesick. We don't know why, but he, he bailed on them. So now they're back in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 says Paul and Barnabas are there, and they're getting ready to go on their next missionary journey to go back and strengthen and encourage those churches that they planted. And John Mark is back on the scene, and Paul and Barnabas are talking about the trip, and Barnabas go, hey, let's take my cousin John Mark with us again. And Paul goes, no way. That guy bailed on us before. Um, we're not taking him. And as they are discussing it, we read this in Acts 15, 39. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. It wasn't necessarily right or wrong, but they just couldn't agree on what to do. And later we'll read, later in Paul's life, we'll read that actually John Mark and him were restored relational and, and, and Paul has positive things to say about John Mark. But at this point, we just have this example of two Christian leaders that couldn't agree and it wasn't necessarily a right or wrong. As one Christian leader, a friend of mine who, who writes, points out, there are times in life where you can't take John Mark and you can't leave John Mark. In other words, you, you gotta make a decision. Either we take him or we don't. Paul said, don't take him. Barnabas said, take him. So they went their separate ways and God used both of them in their ministry. But there are times when you can't have it both ways. Some of you know the story of George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers, John and Charles. They were both leaders in the Christian uh, ministry movement in the early 1700s in, in, in Britain. And Wesley was actually trained up sort of by the Wesleys. They were good friends and, and loved each other and they both had spent time in the UK ministering and also in the American colonies ministering. Whitfield, as he studied and, and, and progressed, eventually being affected by the Puritans and the, the Reformation, actually began to see a, a commitment to a reform soteriology, meaning he was convinced as he read and taught the scriptures that God does actually elect and predestine people to salvation. We, we see that in, in, in Romans. We see that in, in uh, Ephesians. We see it all over the scriptures. So he became convinced of that. But at the same time, John Wesley was going a very different direction. He was going more about theologically that it's all free will, that no, it's really us that chooses God, but not only that, and rejecting predestination, but he also was starting to teach that in this life, as a follower of Jesus, you can reach sinless perfectionism. Now, I think most of us that are theologically informed would definitely reject, reject that last part about sinless perfectionism. We, we know that's not gonna happen in this life. I don't see that biblically at all. And, and we understand that reform soteriology, but a split happened with these dear friends, and it was a theological split. And Whitfield became known and recognized as a, as a massive leader in the evangelical movement. Thousands of people came to Christ as a result of his preaching. And over the years, Whitfield and the Wesleys, they tried to patch it up, but they just couldn't. Their relationship was messy, and eventually they coined the phrase, we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. But here's the deal. Toward the end of Whitfield's life, as he was contemplating his death before the Wesleys would die, he contacted his very dear old friend, Wesley, and asked him to preach at his funeral. And considering the divide that they had theologic, that's pretty amazing. And that's a good thing. We're for each other. You know, here at the fields, we do care about solid theology. But sometimes you just can't take Mark and leave him. There are churches in this area that, that we have partnered with. At the fields, our statement of faith hasn't changed. What we believe and teach has stayed consistent. I know some friends that have pastored some big churches in the area. They're moving theologically. Okay? They still preach Jesus, but some things have changed that we haven't changed. 
I love them. I hope they don't move away from the authority of Scripture. But we don't see things necessarily the same, but I love them in Christ, and they still are preaching salvation in Jesus alone. So praise God, bless them. But the question is, is do we act with charity towards each other? Are, are we kind to each other? Do we walk in humility? Do we work to be at peace with each other? Or are we critical of each other, gossiping about each other? Uh, do we believe in each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, or are we against each other? We need to be careful of theological feuds and tribalism. We, we need to be discerning, yes, but be kind and give grace to each other. Remember love. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, we're living in a culture of offense. Everybody is offended by so little and by so much. What if we as Christians lived differently? What if we showed kindness and, and grace and patience? What if we didn't seek to crucify everyone or to counsel everyone or to sue everyone like the culture does? I've used this quote over the years. Philip Yancey, Christian author, wrote this years ago. I rejected the church for a time because I saw so little grace there. I returned to the church because I found grace nowhere else. And when we are wronged, going back to that, that, that section, do, do we take re revenge or do we let God take care of it? Loving our enemies. These are incredibly countercultural words for this day, but words that need to be heard. It saddens the heart of God when he sees his kids not getting along. Think about it as a parent. How many times have you said the equivalent if you have more than one child? <laughs> the equivalent of can't, can't you just learn to get along? In God's church, can't we learn to get along? In Colossians 3, we see further instruction on how we are to live with one another in the family of God. I'm gonna take the time. I know I'm going a little bit longer. It's a short psalm, so I can preach a long time, right? Um, but listen to these words. May they bless you and encourage your heart. This is the essence of Christianity. Colossians 3.12. So, as those who have been chosen by God, little lecture in there, right? Holy and beloved. What are we to do? Here's what we're to do. We're to put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility, and gentleness, and, and patience. This is what should characterize the people of God. It doesn't mean theological wishy-washiness, but, but being kind towards each other, bearing one, with one another, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should forgive others. Beyond all these things, put on love. Why? Because it's the perfect bond of unity. The unity that we see Psalm 133 talking about. Love bonds us together, the love of God in Christ Jesus. And, and he goes on to say, let the peace of Christ, what? Rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, that unity, and be thankful. You know, this is so important because what is at stake is the gospel, our partnership in the gospel. You know, Jesus said this, by this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If it shows up in our unity for the body of Christ and for God, our, our being for each other instead of against each other. If we bite and devour, if we complain and grumble about each other, if we're critical of each other, then the world will know the gospel doesn't work because we will look just like them. You know, guys here at the fields, we have experienced incredible unity over the years, for the last 21 years. It's not that we haven't disagreed. It's not that we don't have differences of opinions, but we've never had a church split. We've had those that have left us theologically. We've not changed, but they have changed. Sometimes it's, it, 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 it's hurtful and frustrating because to our elders and our leaders, like that seems like such a small theological preference that you'd leave over that. But we haven't had much disunity. 
You know, it's so great to be preaching on a topic like this where I'm actually not scolding you guys or saying, hey, you guys are about to split the church, stop it. No, we don't have that. But we never take the unity that God's given us for granted. We pray about it regularly as, uni- as leaders because we know that Satan wants to cause disruption. He does it all the time. Leaders get against each other. People get against each other. But we've had this great unity and, 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 and we are so thankful for it. We've learned to work things out with tons of grace. Several years ago, we read a book written by Dr. Barry Corey. He's the president of Biola University, and it's called Love Kindness. And it's a great book, I think, because he talks about the importance of, of, of loving each other well and showing kindness, not just in the church, but out to the world, that, that we love our neighbors well. In that book, one of the concepts that I really latched on to that I like, he talks about having a firm center or core, but being soft on the edges And what he means by that is we as Christians, we do hold to a confession. We hold to the scriptures. This is firm. I'm not immovable. I'm not wishy-washy in that I believe that Jesus is the only way and that the word of God is, is firm. I'm there. We're there. But as we interact with those at the outside, can we be kind and gracious? Can we have soft edges? A, a firm center, but soft and embrace and engage and ask questions, seek to understand what other people believe without compromising what we hold. And when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, can we hold on and major on the majors and minor on the minors? And, and yes, there may be times when theology causes us to go different directions like the Whitfields, like Whitfield and, and the Wesleys. And, and that. Can we, can, can we act charitably, though, towards each other? You know, going into an election season, uh, we as a church, we have endeavored to be what we say all political. It doesn't mean that we don't want you guys to get involved and get involved. We think we should. But folks, we as a church, we're team Jesus. That's the flag we are going to fly and march under. Our hope is in the gospel. It's not in our government. So we're going to fly that flag As we get into the book of Daniel, we're going to point to how do we live in a pagan culture, which the world's always been pagan, and how do we serve Jesus and love those around us and point them to Jesus? That's the flag. We're marching. Team Jesus. We never take the unity that God has given us for granted, but we learn to give each other room and and, and grace as Christians, and we pray that God will continue to protect us our unity, as the psalm says this morning. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head coming down on the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It's like the dew of Mount Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. You know, 20 years later after the incident, the L.A. riot, it's the the anniversary of of that time, Rodney King was interviewed, and, and he said this, and I quote, he says, I had to learn to forgive. I couldn't sleep at night. I got ulcers. I had to let go and let God deal with it. No one wants to be mad in their own house. I didn't want to be angry my whole life. It takes so much energy out of you to be mean. Now, I don't know anything about Rodney King if he believed in Jesus, was a follower of Jesus. I'm not saying he was or wasn't. I don't know. He certainly had a troubled soul like many of us and was not what you might call a modeled citizen. In the years to follow the riots, Rodney continued to live a difficult life with more run-ins with the laws and drugs and domestic violence But in the years to come, he would say concerning the officers who had beaten him, he said this, and I think this is profound. This is a quote. Yes, I had to forgive them because I had been forgiven so many times. My country's been good to me, and I've done some things that wasn't pleasant in my lifetime, and I've been forgiven for that. Brothers and sisters, we have done such more horrible things than what we read about people in the news. We have acted treacherously to a holy God and we are guilty and we deserve the wrath of God, but God in his kindness has 
chosen us, has, has brought us into the family of God. He has forgiven us and he has called us to live in unity as brothers and sisters in Christ and to bless those that don't bless us and to be kind to those because they too need the same forgiveness that we have received from Jesus Christ our Lord. And I believe that if we really embrace the gospel and the gospel call on our lives, and if we remember what God has done for us, we will dwell in unity together, but we'll also be salt and light to a culture that doesn't get it. We don't live in a culture of forgiveness, do we? No. And yet the culture needs that. And we are the hope because of the gospel for the culture. Folks, again, today, as I look out, I don't see disunity here at the fields. Many of you have partnered with us for years. Some of you are brand new. A lot of you are brand new. We love that, calling you into the family. But as I look out and I don't see disunity, I can almost guarantee that in some of your hearts out there, you do have avarice against a brother or sister in Christ. There's conflict. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with a, a, a child or a roommate. Maybe it's with a neighbor. And God is calling you to show the kind of forgiveness that he has shown you to that person. He's calling you to repent if you're holding a grudge holding something against someone to cause disunity. And so what I want to do is I want to give you some time to reflect as we get ready to celebrate the Lord's table. We're told in scripture, we're actually warned that don't come and celebrate the forgiveness we have in Christ if you're holding something against your brother or sister in Christ. No, go to that person, ask them for forgiveness, talk to them about that, clean that up, and then celebrate the unity that we have in Christ, the forgiveness. So if you're a follower in Jesus, use this, this time to reflect on that. And if things are good, things are good. As a follower of Jesus, come up and celebrate. Dip the bread in the cup, the bread re which represents God, God's body that was broken for us, the cup, his blood that was shed for all of our sins. And if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, we have something for you too. Not communion, because that, that's for those that are in Christ. What we have for you is that offer of salvation. One of us, one of our pastors, one of our leaders would love to pray with you this morning so you can experience that kind of forgiveness. So we invite you, uh, come up and talk to one of the leaders instead of taking communion. We have that for you. You are welcome too. And let us pray with you and walk with you as we learn this forgiveness from God and to shed it, shed it with others. So let me pray. God, thank you so much for your kindness to us, how you have brought us together in union because of what you've done. Uh, there were walls between us and there was a chasm between us and you and because of your love and kindness you reach out and you cross that chasm may we be peacemakers in our culture may we be uh, united as a church may we bring charity and kindness and, and goodness and grace to those that are far away so they can experience what you've given us we thank you lord and we celebrate you in your name amen